Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. This is one of my favorite with one of our heroes, Katrina Sanders here. And she's here in Milwaukee. And you're not going to believe this. Look at this. She is doing a course and it's sold out on disease prevention and wine tasting. Today, we unpackage what that's all about and how we have to think better about education and what happens in our practices. You do not want to miss this. So listen up. I know you guys will enjoy it and we'll see you soon. All right, we're rolling. Hey, guys, we are here with the amazing Katrina Sanders in our training facility, downtown Milwaukee. And we got a sold out show. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this is so awesome. So I, we've got empty wine glasses. They won't be empty for long. Oh, my we gosh. We got a room full of empty wine glasses, charcuterie. We've got the wine chilling. I'm so excited for this. I'm I like so excited. And I was saying this morning to you, and I was mentioning other, nobody does CE like this. No. Like, if you walk no. into a course... No, that's not just a wine glass. That's like... This is a balloon glass. Yeah, this it's like a giant glass that lets you swirl the wine so that you can aerate Smell it, it, oxygen, aerate. it okay. sniff it. And so today we're going to be going through the five S's of wine tasting. Wow. And we're going to be doing that during a disease prevention workshop. So it's like all the best things, dentistry and wine. My first question is, why are you not here? Okay. Secondly, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> no, but, uh, um, it is crazy fun to watch you do. Now, my favorite thing is I just get to hang out and just oh, sit in the back and yeah. enjoy this. But, um, yeah. if you haven't seen Katrina Sanders f before you're missing out, you are an incredibly gifted human being. Number one, we just enjoy you. You're an incredible Thank educator. You. Um, I was trying to describe to somebody the other day, like, they're like, what's so amazing about it? I'm like, where do I start? Um, your clinical expertise, your, uh, I love the verbal skills part. Like the verbal oh, skills part you. hurts my brain because I'll be writing today and I'll be like, wait, 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 wait. Slow, down. Yeah. slow down. What say that again? Like, how do you, and then the humor part, because not a lot of people can do excellent education and combine the humor. Like you've got some great Thank stories you. with patients. Yeah. But your stories aren't just yours. They're everybody's. That's right. You know, everybody's got the story, right? That's the thing. I, I am not, you know, it's so sweet. Uh, one of your team members came in and she was like, oh my gosh, Katrina's like, I, I can't even like look at you, you know? And mm -hmm. it's like, I, but I'm just like everybody else. I'm, I'm a hygienist. I experience these things clinically. Right. What I experience is no different than what other people experience. Yeah. I'm just looking at the things that we experience in our clinical day with a different lens Yeah. and saying, Patients suck sometimes. They really do. Sometimes they, they do. Sometimes they're 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 difficult. Sometimes <laughs> they they decline our treatment plans. They question our work. Yep. They say things like, you know, will, will my insurance plan cover this? I'm only going to do it if my insurance covers it. They right. say those things, and our immediate reaction inside of dentistry is to kind of take a step back. Right. My reaction is to lean in and go. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. You know? I love that. So I want to be able to empower dentistry to see, yes, when things are going smoothly, when things are perfect in the practice, when you have that perfect patient, that's like, tell me more about right. all the treatment that I need. If that's going to help me to be a healthier individual, I want to do that. It'd be great if every patient was like that. That's right. not the reality. So right. we have to be able to look at dentistry differently. And so I think I give people a little bit of that, you know, lens, maybe looking at dentistry through rosé colored glasses. Whoa. Oh, see what I did whoa, there. Oh, look at that. She's, she's weaving it in. I just, is I that just a pun? That. No, I, that's not a pun. I don't that's know if a, it's a pun. It's like a, it's a, like a fort you're foreshadowing. Ah, uh, there's that's, what, yeah, that's that? exactly what it is. Yeah, I yes. don't even know if that's right. Now there are a lot of people that follow the podcast that are younger and newer to the profession. It's fun to watch this, like we do this whole thing. So I, I'm going to do a little introduction on you because okay. every time you're here, I want to do, and every time and just add a little bit of context to who you are, Okay, but you're not just 
uh, an educator. You're not just a hygienist. You're not just a treatment coordinator. You're not just an influencer. Your background is tremendous. And so Thank I was you. chatting with a, a bunch of people this week, like you come from AZ Perio yes. with Ralph. Now yes. I've had Ralph. Ralph. Now, Ralph, if you're listening, like, wait, have you had him on the pod? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Stop it. What was it like? I don't even know what he was talking about. He, I have no idea. he went into the savant level, like sub, I know. like, He's he went into another level of consciousness and it was so far beyond my brain. I was like, well, this yeah. is like genius level stuff. So yes. Ralph shout out. Now I'm, we're actually, you know, I was describing to Laura AZ Perio mm -hmm. and can you talk about that? So I, I guess my point is this, is like your education, it didn't start there, but you went through there, right? Yes. Yes. So AZ Perio is a large periodontal surgical group practice in Arizona. We've got yeah. a large, um, you know, a grouping of patients that we see in the Valley metropolitan area. Okay. And the development of AZ Perio really started to escalate when we brought on Dr. Wilson, Dr. Okay. Ralph Wilson, um, and we brought in, you know, a, a group of periodontists who recognized that hygienists are actually a terrific advocate inside of not just preventive dentistry, but active periodontics. Wow. Now we're taught non-surgical things like how to do scaling and root planing, how to do a profi, how to do a perio maintenance. Those are the things that we are trained on. And yet in, inside of the periodontal space, there's a huge opportunity for us inside of the work that we're doing. Yeah. They are, I'm not going to say they, I'm going to say the periodontal profession, as it were, is not leveraging and utilizing the skill sets and talents of dental hygienists the way they should be used. Right. So in our perio practice, the dental hygienist does absolutely everything that a dental hygienist can legally do in the practice. And that means that it frees up our doctors to be right. able to do the clinical things that only a doctor can do. Brilliant. So we have dental hygienists that do things like see our new patients and walk the new patient through the entire process of care start to finish. So doctor comes in at the end because the thing doctor needs to legally do is diagnose the patient right. and provide the prescriptive. We don't recommend we prescribe treatment to the patient. Okay. So the prescriptive elements of what treatment needs to be done. And then the doctor leaves. Okay, go back to that prescribed. Like, yes. go, you got to expand okay, on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, a recommendation would be you should go to the gym every day. Right. A recommendation would be have five servings of fruits and vegetables. Okay. Um, those are recommendations. We use that recommendation word when we're talking about treatment modalities that need to be done in order to address an active infection for the patient. Very cool. And when we use the word recommendation, somehow inside of like the lizard brain of our patients, right. they think, so there's, so I have the option to not do it. Now right. we know inside of autonomy, the patient always has an option not to do it. Right. They, they could easily walk out. You, you, if you're in a hospital and you've got a gunshot wound and you choose not to have that treatment done, you could, if you can walk out, you can walk out for sure. They have an autonomy inside of that. Yeah. But the idea is we need to be coloring this picture to help our patients understand that the treatment that we are talking about is a prescription from a licensed practitioner because okay. that's what it is. Okay, so we're this is this is a whole nother podcast here. We're yeah. we're talking about some very cool how, but this is how many people are at AZ Perio? Do you still work there? I do. Okay. Yeah. How many how many how many people are on the team at AZ Perio? Oh, we've got I think over 200. Okay, I so think. my first thought is how do you get 200 people mm -hmm. to think the same way? Yeah, or close you, to the same way. You, you need some good to, leadership. You have to have leadership. You have to have a culture inside of the practice. Okay. And you have to be very crystal clear about your core values. So this is crazy because I know you and I have talked about core values a Love lot. It. Um, so I'm reading this book right now called The Trust Edge. Have you read it? No. Who wrote, okay. who wrote it? Uh, David. Mur, 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 mur. It, okay. I, actually, I don't even know the first or the last name of the author, but it's called The Trust Edge. Okay. Uh -huh. And this book is absolutely unbelievable. Tell me why. Inside of the book, it talks about the fact that trust is the true currency of business. It true. is. Because people will buy if they trust. Yeah. People will buy if they, they will actively seek out a Starbucks because they trust that logo. They trust that there's going to be consistency in what they order, that I can go to a Starbucks here in Milwaukee. I can go to a Starbucks in Honolulu and I can order the same drink and get it prepared exactly the same way. There's consistency. Um, I, I see a lot of trust inside of, um, you know, businesses that have worked and focused to maintain that right. trust. And then you see things 
I'll use an example. Um, Southwest right. Airlines had a big issue with trust because they were not consistent. They lacked some competency in what was happening you know, over the holiday season with flights and things like that. And because of that, because of that decline in trust, they see a decline in their overall revenue. Right. Trust is the currency of business. Okay. You and I so, were separated at birth somehow. Uh, well, okay. So we're like totally alignment here. This is what's crazy about this book though. What? He talks about the eight pillars of okay. trust. There are eight specific pillars of trust. And inside of that, you have to be able to build those pillars of trust. Very cool. And he says that a critical aspect to that trust is knowing your core values. That's a huge piece. In the book, the author says that if you as a business owner, practice owner, whatever, if you are not communicating your core values and your mission statement to your team every 30 days, every 30 days, your team members cannot recite that back to you. Right. Now that's important because in a dental practice, if you think about AZ Perio, I mentioned I walk through the entire process of care. A doctor comes in at the end. Yeah. So who's conveying those core values to the patient? Yeah. Myself, the assistant in the in the operatory with me, the front office team member, even the website. Right. These are all touch points before doctor even has the opportunity to communicate with the patient. Yeah. Now we do things like for a new patient, the doctor will call the patient the night before and say, you know, hello, I'm Dr. Wilson. I very much look forward to meeting you tomorrow. I've reviewed your chart. Do you have any questions for me? We're able to build those things out. So doctor can communicate some layers of trust early on. But right. the, the important piece inside of this is that if we don't know the core values of the practice, then I don't have a scaffolding. I don't have a framework for how to behave inside of this. Yeah, you are you are dropping the biggest bomb here because this is like the single biggest opportunity in the future for a hundred reasons. I just like I'm cataloging everything you said. You grow if you grow up in a house where values are important, mm -hmm. your parents say it over and over. My I say things over they can repeat. You they can know repeat what I'm gonna say. Children should be seen and not heard. You know, just even yeah. those like little things that you hear over and over and over again, right. and that becomes a, a part of you. One hundred percent. Same yeah. thing. So we put it in as a system. So every Monday we do core value shout outs because we have to yes. prove that they are alive and well because it's you can't make it an effort. Oh, we're gonna try it. You, you have know. to see how it's actually happening inside of your actions and your choices. One hundred percent. Now you and yeah. I have done a lot of these. I'm an optimist. I love optimism. I also live in a world where you can't open a web browser without seeing the word AI at all. Yes, yes. And so we don't know where that's going to go. But I tell everybody, like, I, AI will do a lot of things in the future. Yes. What will be one of the circumstances of that is we will not trust things. In the future, you'll watch a yes. video and know, yes. you will guess, is this really? Right her or is it not her? And this is your opportunity as a team, as a family, and as a clinician, clinician to lean into the currency of yes. the future. Do you agree? Uh, 100%. Inside of that, I don't know if AI is ever going to fully be able to demonstrate the layer of empathy that is required inside right. of our profession. And that is a huge reason why I believe computers will never be able to fully replace what we do. Right. I'll give you an example. I had a patient come into my uh, practice to see me. Uh, this was about two months after my father had passed. Okay. So I'm working in clinical practice. I'm seeing profi perio maintenance cases this particular day. Front office team member comes back and she's like, you know, Susie at 10 o'clock is here and she is irate. She is so angry. And I'm like, what, what's going on? You know, I, I was, I was exhausted. I was fatigued. It's like, oh, here we go. You know, I, again, patients can sometimes suck, right? Right. So 10 a.m., um, you know, I go out to the reception area. I'm like, what's, what's going on? Susie's upset. She does not want to fill out the paperwork. She has to fill out her health history. It's time to update that. And she refuses to do it. And so I said, you know, Susie, why don't you come on back with me? I brought her back to my operatory. I closed the door and I sat down with her and I, I said, I understand that you don't want to fill out the paperwork. She said, I, I refuse to fill out the paperwork. You know, I mean, just refuse. Okay. Yeah. That's some inflammatory verbiage, right? For sure. Uh, so I said, that's totally fine. Do you mind if I ask you a question? And she said, sure. And I started at the top and I said, do you have arthritis? She said, no. I said, do you have anxiety? No. Do you have, and I, I started from the A's and went through every wow. single condition with her and I listed them off and we got about halfway through and she started crying. 
so I put the paperwork down and I asked, you know, Susie, what's going on? And she said, I'm so sorry. My husband has been sick for a very long time. I've been his caregiver. He just passed away three days ago. And I have been filling out so much paperwork in his loss. I've been filling out paperwork with the funeral home, with how he's going to be cremated. I've been filling up. I mean, I am, I am, I am up to my ears in paperwork. I am, I am so over the paperwork. Yeah. So I put the clipboard aside and I said, we don't have to do this today. It's awesome. So here's what she says to me. Well, I came in because of your cancellation policy. This woman had lost her husband. Now we have these operations in place, right? right. The rule is if you cancel and da, 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 then, you know, you have to pay the whatever cancellation fee and we don't honor cancellations 24 hours before, you know, all of these things that we have in place. Those are the systems and processes that a dental practice has to be successful. Right. Absolutely. And a computer would be able to draw that line and say, Susie didn't show up or, you know, whatever. And let's go ahead and automatically charge her account, all that jazz. But there's an empathy inside of this. 100%. Patients are number one. And I knew I didn't have to, hold on, I'll be right back. Leave, go ask my doctor for permission. Right. I didn't have to ask for that. I knew inside of our core values that as long as I took care of that patient, whatever that patient needed that day, because when I tell this story, I'll tell you, the very first thing that happens, this will be in a room full of hygienists. Hygienists will raise their hand. Somebody always asks, and what does your doctor do? And I said, my, my doctor said, thank you for taking care of that patient. So I said to Susie, you know, Susie, I, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. And, and she's like, you know, I've got family coming in from out of town for the funeral. I've got all these things going on. So I walked her out to the front and we've got, you know, Starbucks gift cards that just sit in the front area for, you know, if a patient's upset or we're running behind or whatever. Right. And I handed her a gift card and I said, hey, this is, this is from AZ Perio. Go, go to Starbucks, go sit, have a coffee by yourself, Think about the beautiful memories that you have forever with your husband. And when you're ready, we'll get you back on the schedule. Yeah. And she left. Now think about how much money practices spend on marketing themselves in showing that, you know, we care for our patients. Right. What did I just do? I just demonstrated not only our core values for Susie, but Susie goes back to her home to her kids, her family members are like, I thought you were supposed to be at the dentist. Right. And she says to them, Actually, the dentist sent me to Starbucks to have a coffee and let me just be present here. Yeah. That's core values. Yeah. And that's a team that's invested in the long haul of this. That's it. Do you know that's what I mean? Right. Like, it's not the now. It's. I couldn't bill anything for that. That was a $0 right. hour for me. Well, gosh, if that's all we're tracking, if that right. is all that we care about is our production, then we're creating. And, and this is, I think, the important piece of what EZ Perio does we look at numbers, we look at production every day. We've got our, you know, big, hairy, audacious goal. We look at, you know, what do we want to see? Are we, what percentage are we on our way to our goal? What opportunities do we have? What openings does doctor have? Th those, those, the, the masculine energy around a lot of that is those processes are built out. That is the framework. Right. That framework is intended to protect so that when something like this happens, you know, the, the bone graft material falls out, the sutures don't go in, uh, the patient's anesthesia isn't working as readily as possible, that when those things happen, that the framework protects us inside of that. But it also means that we have to be okay yeah. when we're not productive because at the end of the day, we're not taking care of people's insurance plans and billing. We're taking care of humans yeah. and humans with beautiful, robust lives. And, and our job is to be a part of that yeah. and to make it better for them. I love it. I love it. And that's a big piece of what you're going to be covering. It's yeah. the, uh, you know, it's the behavioral aspects. You can teach a lot of things, mm -hmm. but that behavioral piece, when you put it together with the business structure, the clinical piece, yeah. that's when life takes off. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So it's yes. so cool. Yeah. I have so many questions. Okay. So we're going to talk about some fun stuff here in yeah, a little bit, but I want to do this first. Okay. So yeah. I, what are you talking about today? Oh like, my gosh. If I'm going to sit here today, what am I going to learn? So we're talking about disease prevention okay. today. Um, disease prevention is really uh, something that dental hygienists focus on in our training. And yet we get out into the real world after we graduate from hygiene school. And I think we're so limited on what our opportunities are inside of disease prevention. So 
we're looking at a myriad of diseases that we can see in the oral cavity or that patients are going to present with in the operatory and ultimately talk about what our role is inside of that. We're going to do this from a team perspective because we need our doctors, we need our front office team members, we need our practice managers to understand that when a patient comes in and they have periodontitis, that we have to be treating this disease fully and thoroughly. We need the time to effectively treat these cases. We need the products, we need the medicaments, we need the entire scaffolding of you know, what that process of care looks like for a periodontally diseased patient right. to occur. We need the same thing with caries. We need the same thing with oral pathological lesions, oral cancers, tethered oral tissues, airway complications, infection control. That inside of all of this, these are all of the ways that we contribute to preventing disease. Yeah. And we have to be able to break apart what these modalities look like so that we can understand what are some of the modern trends or techniques inside of delivering care for our patients. Right. No one who takes education would debate any of what you said. You said it so well. Oh, thank you. You are an, so what do people get wrong yeah. in not doing this? So, like you, you teach this all the time, Yes, so but the, you don't see it all the time. You don't, you don't. This is what's so crazy. When we talk, the average statistic right now is one in three individuals who have dental insurance use it routinely. Really? Yeah. Okay. So we already know that there's a small portion of our population that will come in and receive routine dental care. And by routine, I think we're all in alignment that this is a patient who comes in for their every six month or right? right. And I tell this story all the time, but where did that six months come from? Okay. This drives me crazy. In the 1950s, there was a toothpaste called I pan a toothpaste, yeah. right? So that spokes beaver, Bucky the beaver says, yep. brush, 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 right? And then at the end of the commercial, he says, brush your teeth with Ipana toothpaste and see your dentist twice a year. Yeah. Now that was done by Ipana toothpaste as a means of encouraging these individuals, the general public to go in, see a dental hygienist and have that dental hygienist say, oh my gosh, the Ipana toothpaste commercial you know, brought you in. Absolutely. You need to be brushing with Ipana. It was an interesting marketing strategy, was yeah, it not? It was. Well, that was in the 1950s. And here we are 70 years later. And most individuals across the United States think it's completely normal to see your dentist twice a year. But Katrina, this is the way we've always done That's it. That's the way we've all... Okay, literally, <laughs> I'm not kidding you. If you see my very first slide in this program, it's going to say, that's how we've always done it. Yeah. That is the toxic statement that we have said inside yeah. of dentistry. In fact, I think that is the most disease-ridden statement. Dirty mouth, you got to clean up that, yeah. right? We, we joke around here, those are the seven most expensive words in business. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. it absolutely is. Yeah. Now, inside of all of this, we have seen an evolution inside of dentistry. And we'll right. talk about that this afternoon, how we've evolved in dentistry in a myriad of ways, disease prevention, uh, infection control, technology. I mean, there's so many ways that we've seen a change. Right. And yet it doesn't matter because right. at the end of the day, we are still doing the same procedures. If you're using a rubber cup polisher right. and you're using hand instruments and you're treating your patients every six months, no matter what the complexity of the disease looks like, right. We are not delivering the correct layer of care for that patient. Yeah. We look at the prevalence of oral disease. Currently, the statistic is about one in two adults between the ages of 30 and 79 have some form of periodontitis. Okay. Dental caries is the number one chronic childhood disease. It is five times more prevalent than asthma. And every hour, one individual will lose their life to the ramifications of oral cancer. Wow. So when you take a look at that, the reality is the disease is not stopping. Right. Porphomonas gingivalis isn't like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that you guys are all banding together and trying to help. The disease is still occurring. The yeah. disease is showing up in our chairs and across our communities. Yeah. And so when we take a look at what it is we understand about prevention, the first step in that is what are we doing to actually prevent this? Because there's such an activity of the disease right now. Oh my gosh, you're this this is going to be a 4-hour podcast. It's, okay. I, yeah. Already we're already going Buckle up everybody. But, but, but back <laughs> to the whole thing like um you know, I have so many thoughts. Well, the first thought is like there are people that clean teeth and there are people that change lives. There are people 100%. That, and so 100%. if you're looking at a different way to see your profession, it starts with this. Now, one of the things I'm passionate about, you're going to teach some amazing things here today. I get this question. I'm going to ditch it to you. Okay, um I'm a dentist. Can I just send my hygienist and 
by osmosis let katrina transform her i know you're oh my gosh okay oh, just just go there crazy. just okay. go there mm-hmm. just go there let's go mm-hmm. there what would you say um to the dentist yes to the dentist it starts at the top it's it has to start at the top yeah. and actually that's probably where i would start is it yeah. has to start at the top but but, but you're going to teach them everything you know, i want them to come back motivated and do of all course. this stuff and and what you're doing is you're bringing in a team member and now expecting that team member to transform the entirety of the scaffolding of your hygiene department right. including how you decision diagnosing periodontitis right. diagnosing incipient decay versus active decay identifying modalities in how to detect oral cancer, looking at pathological lesions, uh, transforming the way we look at oral and subsequent systemic disease. You are expecting one individual, or maybe you send your two hygienists, you're expecting two individuals to go to a workshop, come back after three hours and implement this when these individuals are not going to have the support from the top. Yeah. Now, it would be one thing if the doctor was like, you know what, I, cause I've worked with doctors who are very, you know, fixated in, you know, high end cosmetics. I want to, you know, be over here. I want to, you know, cut and, you know, prep veneers all day long. That's what I want to do. I want my hygienist to really be the wheelhouse of the practice and I'm going to give him or her everything they need. So I'm going to send them to this workshop. And then afterwards, I'm going to sit down with them. I'm going to say, walk me through the pieces that you learned that you find to be impactful inside of our practice. What pieces of equipment do you need? How much more time do you need in the patient hour in order to be able to implement these strategies? Uh, what support do you need from our front office team members? Um, you know, What ways do we need to maybe change some of the protocols? What needs to be done in the clinical notes? What types of conversations do we need to be transforming? What needs to be added to the website? Right. Okay. Do you see where I'm going? I absolutely. That when you implement implement a change in the practice. It has to go through every step. It, it That change is like hot potato. It has to touch every hand. Yeah. As a hygienist, if I go to a disease prevention workshop and I learn about how great probiotics are for oral disease and I come back and I want to implement that and, and the doctor says, yeah, go ahead. That, that's great. Okay. So now I need the doctor to understand what these probiotics are, why these probiotics are important, why patients who not only have gingivitis, but periodontitis, peri-implantitis decay risk for candida are all going to be terrific candidates for that. I need the doctor to be on board so that when I prescribe this, that the doctor comes in behind me and says, absolutely, Katrina is correct. Here's why we need to integrate this into the practice. I need my hygiene or whoever the lead is who's ordering products to be able to order these products, stock them in the practice. I need my friend office team to understand how we bill for that. I need to know how do we integrate this into an explosion code so that anytime that I'm diagnosing a patient with gingivitis, periodontitis, periimplantitis, decay, candida risk, that these are automatically exploding into the the patient's care plan. I also need support from the front office team in the event that the patient calls in and says, hey, I don't exactly remember how often am I supposed to be taking that probiotic once a day, twice a day? I'm not quite sure because it's going to be different depending on the patient. Um, I might need an administrative team member to help me print out even post-operative instructions so I can send the patient out with it. Right. I need every single team member to be involved in that tiny protocol. Yeah. And the biggest issue that I see is that I will go, I'll present, I travel all the time. I'm speaking, I'm presenting, I'm delivering. And I can't tell you how many times a hygienist will come up to me and say, all of this was amazing. I wish my doctor were here. Yeah. That I think doctors have this thought, number one, that hygienists want to be empowered to do this. And we do. But we want to be supported by our doctors. We want to be backed up by our doctors. And unfortunately, what I start to see, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, we're going to do AAP staging and grading. And we're going to talk through clinical decision making around AAP staging and grading. Well, when we talk about that, we're going to look at the entirety of the complexity of periodontitis, and we're actually going to workshop that. So in the afternoon, I'm going to say, all right, so a patient comes in, they look like this, they're a healthy patient. How do you deliver care to that patient in your practice? Get together, doctors, hygienists, front office team members, what modalities are you going to integrate? And they have a resource, so they're going to start checking off the boxes. Yes, we want, to, we want to do salivary diagnostic testing. Yes, we want to integrate this. Yes, we want to integrate that. So they're going to be building out the entirety of their protocol together right. as a team. And then having the time to sit down and say, so if we're going to take this, we're going to lift this. And this is going to be the procedure that we're going to integrate in our practice for a patient who looks like this. Yeah. What needs to happen Monday morning so we can do this? Yeah. You, oh my right? gosh, this is so, so, so many things you said are powerful. Um, number one, nothing says support like, I'll, I got your back. I'm coming with you. Right. Number two, I'm going to watch this happen today where people, the, the hygienist will whisper to the doc like, pss, 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 uh-huh. and the doc will go, uh-huh. 
Yeah. Like you can yeah. see they're calibrating. They're doing micro calibrations right. here. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps. I, I know. love those now, micro calibrations. Now let's That's just so go, important. let's go to the super simple. As a patient, mm-hmm. you could have a doctor and a hygienist speaking a foreign language that you 100%. don't even know. 100%. And I could look at their eyes and go, are they aligned? Like, I don't even know what you're saying. And I can tell by your body language and what dentists don't understand is if you're not calibrated with your hygienist. You can say whatever you want. I can see it. Mm -hmm. I can see the hygienist that takes the posture to move back. Yep. 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 You know, you're spot on. Okay. So, so you're never going to look at a restaurant experience the same way. Although you're, (laughs) you're a consultant. So, you know, it's, it is so hard being a consultant and going to a restaurant. You can't enjoy it it as much as you you would like. I I can't tell you how many times I walk into a restaurant and the greeters, like, you know what I'm talking about at the greeting station? Don't greet you. Yeah. You're like, I'm like, I'm just standing there. We like, we have this like death stare until they're like, (laughs) Hi, do you want a table for two? <laughs> hello, thank you so much for saying hello. You know, yeah. so I can't tell you how many times I'll go into a restaurant and you know right away, it's it's not what anybody's saying. Right. It's the choreographed dance behind you. Now, you know, people talk about like French laundry all the time, right? Yeah. That's like the amazing like Michelin Which I've never experience. been. I've never been either. I want to go. I never, I, we Andy, should go sometime. Andy, you, you're going to take go. us. We're, you're going to take us. Great. All right, let's hop on your private jet, Andy. Um, but you know, when you go to a restaurant like that, it is choreographed. Yeah. There is no room for, for, you know, issues. I mean, it, it's just, you know, ships passing in the night, the, the, the drink comes down to the, the empty glass gets taken away. I mean, it's, you, it, you, it's not cumbersome. It's not clunky, right. but it, you will go to a restaurant sometimes and experience this where it's like, where is the waitress? What's going on? Yeah. You know? Well, how many times do you just leave a patient sitting in the operatory? Everybody's running behind and the patient's just sitting there staring at the wall going, where is everybody? Right. Like, did they just leave me in here? It's, it's those little nuances that an intellectual, a, a human being is going to observe and they, right. they won't be able to put their, their finger on it. But um, I walked in and nobody greeted me. Everybody at the front desk, they were all on the phone. So I just sat down. Then when somebody got off the phone, nobody said, hello, hi. How, you know, so I had to be the one to get up and say, hi, I'm here for my nine o'clock. Right. Then I'm sitting here. It's 9.05. Nobody's coming back to get me. Nobody's said anything. It's 9.10. I'm sitting there watching this because by the way, like none of these magazines are up to date. They're all from the 1990s. Yeah. You know what I mean? So what am I supposed to do? So I'm just sitting on my phone. My phone has a watch, uh, you know, a clock on it. So I'm watching as, you know, I'm playing a game on my phone or on Instagram, aimlessly scrolling and nobody's brought me back. All of these little inconsistencies yeah and that's before anybody's actually said anything that's before i'm interacting with the clinical competence those are micro subtractions tiny tiny little things that we are casting judgment on right away oh by the time you get back into the operatory is the operatory clean is it organized do i sit down on a chair and it's still wet because the cavi wipe hasn't dried fully Uh, oh there's another judgment now let's add into that the fact that the doctor comes in and that's the piece de resistance. That's why I'm there is to meet with that clinician. They're the ones that are going to provide me with this care. I can forgive the fact that like maybe the magazines are outdated or whatever. Right. I'll forgive all those things, but you better be clinically competent. And now I'm seeing this very uh, awkward, like first date interaction between the doctor and the hygienist or the doctor and the assistant yep. or, you know, or, or a hygienist and assistant, you know, it, it's those little things. It even like, it drives me crazy when I, I would work in clinical practice, I'd be working on a patient, front desk would come back. I'm literally working with a patient and the front desk would say, you know, oh, doctor's buying Panera today. What do you want? That's so weird. You're going to have me list off my lunch order while I'm delivering clinical care to a patient. Like it's it's those little micro nuances that completely erode and break it down. So when we come together, when we bring the entirety of the team, when they hear a speaker say, here's why we need to integrate this into clinical practice. Right. And I'm going to give you and the team time to now say, how do we take this? How do we integrate this? So that our anybody who has a touch point with a patient experiencing this disease modality understands right. why we're approaching care this way. Right. So if you're a dentist listening, your blood pressure might be going up going, you're right, you're right now. Now let's get everybody in the right headspace. Most offices are sitting on a mountain of opportunity. Huge. Do you know what I mean? Like it's Huge. your first thought is you think about what's wrong. Yeah. But then if you really change your brain to go, oh my gosh, we've got a mountain of right mm-hmm. that we can make happen here. Like mm-hmm. those little steps. Because remember, your practice didn't get here overnight. That's right. Do you know what I mean? It's not like 20 years. You're going to turn it around in a month. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. So... 
you it's know. the flywheel. It, it's the good to great concept of right. these. It's the small little things. And sometimes we think that it has to be this like massive improvement. You know, uh, yes, I, uh, uh, going back to the restaurant experience, I was uh, at dinner a few nights ago with some dental consultants. We were having a really nice time. The restaurant was absolutely stunning. It was one of those like they had really kind of funky decor and c- cool, funky music, a DJ playing some, you know, I mean, the a- ambiance, the atmosphere was just amazing, right? Yeah. So, you know, there was obviously a huge investment that went into this restaurant to make it this incredible environment. And we see that in dental practices, do we not? Where these amazing spa looking practices, you know, you get your paraffin hand wick, wax done or whatever while you're getting your profi done, you know, that we spend the time doing all these big, grandiose things. Right. Well, the server didn't introduce herself. There were six of us. She took drink orders from four of us, not myself, not, you know, my fiance. Um, She didn't ask, you know, when we were ready to place an order, half of us didn't even have menus. You know, it's, it's, so you spend all this time doing this big grandiose thing and the small things of saying, Hey, we want a guest when they come into our restaurant to feel like they are welcome. Right. Hi, welcome. I I hope you guys are all having a wonderful day. Can I get some cocktails into all of you? Come on, let's get started. That's you know what so, I mean? Absolutely. It, it, it's the small things. And when enough of these small things accumulate, you start to see this beautiful, robust blossoming yeah. happen inside of your team members. There's so much evidence around everyone on what you just said. Mm-hmm. Everyone's favorite restaurants are not empty. There you go. They're overflowing. That's right. When the bill comes, and I'm going to take you to mind one of the, you're just... You and I, I, I'll pay, and, I, oh, and you go. You great. go. We'll order Woo! <laughs> and Sarah often says, "Like, how much was dinner?" I'm like, "I had no idea. I don't know. I had Just no idea. Card. I it no was idea. like put it on my tab. It was. I mean, a lot of it they're selling the invisible, but yes. it's an emotional connection that you have to. Oh this my whole gosh! Thing, so they say all the time, people make decisions based on emotion, right. but they corroborate that with logic. I you don't know even I mean? know if they use logic anymore sometimes. I don't think people but use logic, but you know, in it's their a little head, bit of it's logic, logic yeah. to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and, and therein lies the, the issue. What you said is spot on. It's the invisible things. Right. It's the invisible things that people will comment on. And it is interesting the number of times that you can see some of those things in like a Yelp or a Google review right. where literally your patient base is telling you right away, like this bothered me. I did not like this. But how many times do you just have the, I mean, I'll say it, we're in the Midwest. Like Midwest people, for the most part, are very nice. Yeah. They are very cordial. They are very kind. They, you know, I, you walk past somebody on the sidewalk, they'll say hello to you. Yeah. That's not like that in Arizona. I'll yeah. just say that. But people are so kind here that people won't call out or say those things. Oh, you sure. You know what I mean? Sure. They'll just sit there quietly. Well, how many times are your patients just sitting there quietly? Meanwhile, they're like, uh, I don't, you yeah. know, th- this was dirty over here or, you know, I've noticed there are bugs in the ceiling that are on that like, like ceiling tile or whatever. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to say anything. Yeah. You and I've had such, it. so I, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm, you know, it's the good land mm-hmm. here. You are from here. Mm-hmm. I lived in Arizona and what you said is exactly, that's where I met yeah. Sarah. Oh. And when you live in Arizona and this isn't for all Arizonians, but you literally go into your garage, yeah. you close close yeah. your garage before That's you right. get out of your car. Exactly. Yeah. You have a wall that has to be six foot seven yeah, so that you, you can't see. Of course. Yeah. There, there were people that live. I've never, I yeah. think there's people that live there. Right. In yeah, my yeah. neighborhood, if you look at somebody, you're done. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you got to go out gotta there go, uh, before hello, you know it. They got know. chairs. Somebody oh, brought a so- yeah. solo fire pit. Bring out the they cooler, got a cooler and it's like 1130. Open. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is not like that. In it's Arizona awesome. At all. It's all walled off. Everyone, it, it just is a hey, very different. We are not anti-Arizona. No, a lot no, of love. A lot yeah, of love. Lots of love for Arizona. Just, it's a, just a different dynamic. Totally. But it tells you a lot about, you know, just the, the cadence of people right. and, and how they are that, you know, there some people will be more over and they'll say some people won't yeah and when you think about you know the the brilliance of what happens inside of a practice think about it you have patients that come in and see your dental or or you know hygiene departments every three four or six months these these patients for one reason or another do trust you yeah for sure and the biggest issue that i see is that dentistry doesn't necessarily fully understand that with these individuals these patients who come in every three four or six months that these individuals at a minimum are experiencing risk factors associated with oral disease right these patients trust you 
And inside of this, we know that if we can identify their risk profile, if we can look at these patients and say, you have a family history of cardiovascular disease, you have four to C granules in the mouth. Four to C granules mean that you likely have an elevated cholesterol level. You have uncontrolled inflammation in your mouth. We've been telling you to floss over and over and over again. And that flossing and your every six month recare is not working for right. you. So if you have a family history of cardiovascular disease, you, you already have a 50% elevated risk of experiencing cardiovascular disease yourself. Yeah. When you have uncontrolled oral inflammation, uh, Bill Donine notated in their preceptorship, you have a 50% elevated risk of experiencing cardiovascular risk. Yeah. So now let's think about the fuel that we're throwing on this inflammatory fire for yeah. this patient, right? And the patient's been coming in every six months and flossing isn't working and every six months isn't working. Now you feel bad because you've been seeing the patient every six months and it's like, how do I convert this patient from a profi right. into doing active treatment? Or, you know, how do I tell the patient that what we're doing isn't working? Now I feel bad. Like right. something I'm doing isn't working. These patients trust you. For sure. We you're, have to have that conversation, right? And you're dropping big bombs here. You just, Bail and Donine, who, who've been on their podcast several times, like oh that's gosh. like the cornerstone. Now, I'm just going to say this. If you get nothing out of this podcast, which I hope you do, that is like foundational because we used to say it could be, it right. might be, there's right. a possibility, possibility now. A what what they've done is they, they're groundbreaking in giving, we have so much research to yes. show that what happens in here. Yes you've got it right at your fingertips. You don't even need to be a dental professional. That's right. To enjoy it. You Can know, you speak more on that? Oh my, it, it, so it is unbelievable what we're unpacking inside of that oral and subsequent systemic disease right. profile. And this is where I think we have to change that conversation right. because our patients are so used to seeing us as I've, I've been going in every six months, I get my teeth cleaned. Okay. Well, language issue number one, we don't clean teeth. Where I'm not a tooth cleaner. That's not what I do. Like I, I'm I not a cleaning lady. I oh, that drives me crazy. I, I think you said this last time. Like cleaning you, is what somebody does in right, your office yeah, after, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Get yeah. the mops out, whatever. But I, I'm burning up because like you're I, like, oh my gosh, you, <laughs> get comfortable. It's get like comfortable. it's like hot here in Milwaukee. <laughs> no, it's great. Uh, you know, but I I really think that's important first and foremost. Right. The, the vast majority of the issue that I see inside of patients declining treatment plans across the United States is a lack of value and trust in what, what you, we do. What are you saying? So yeah, so what I'm saying is these individuals see our value as um, I have a dental insurance. Right. The dentist I go to takes my dental insurance. So I'm going to use my free coupon. Right. Right. So I'm going to do just a short call up. My fiance, Dale, is traveling with me. He's the best in the whole wide world. He is the best. He's Look amazing. at that. He's over oh. there taking photos. Oh gosh, he's, he's like here. your social media manager. Oh my gosh, like he's, he's, like, got... he's all the things. Okay. So I'm, now I'm nervous because I'm going to call him out. <laughs> um, so Dale and I are total opposites in many ways. And yeah. one of those is that he's like, you know, those people that are like obsessed with like coupons. You know what I mean? Like is that he's, true, Dale? He's, he's, are you, is that true, honey? Do you love coupons? I love he, he loves, he's like, I love coupons. So he like, he, and so he will like find a coupon for like free donut holes from Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. He'll clip that out. He'll, you know, watch the expiration date on the coupon. He will only go into the Dunkin' Donuts to get his like free donut holes. You know, the whole point of the coupon is like you go in and then you're like, oh, and you know what? Might as well get some coffee, da, 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 you know, the whole yeah. thing. No, he, he just wants his, his donut holes. Yeah. He'll use his coupon and then off he goes goes. He's not seeing this as Dunkin' Donuts is a breakfast experience. Right. And Dunkin' Donuts is not built to say, oh, I'm so glad that you're using this coupon. We have the best coffee. Right. We, can I get you a large coffee? We have, you know, if you love this, you know, you'll love our, our bear claws or our apple fritters or whatever. Yeah. They are not built and designed to do that. Right. It's, it's transactional. It's thank you, sir, for your coupon. And here are your donut holes. And then Dale walks away feeling whole inside of the fact that he got his donut holes. Mm -hmm. And the person at the checkout register did their job of collecting the coupon. Yeah. But inside of that, there's opportunity. 100%. And we're just talking about Dale showing up and buying, you know, getting donuts. We're talking about dentistry and the the health care of a patient right so these patients come in they get their free this is what they see it's transactional i'm going to get my free cleaning my insurance covers that's yeah. what i'm going to get yeah what they don't understand inside of that is the fact that they are presenting with these risk factors and if we don't educate them on this that we're going to run into major complications down the road it's not just you could lose a tooth and then we'd have to do tooth replacement right. because for whatever reason the general public does not see teeth as body parts yeah they, they see don't. it as like you put it on your pillow you get a couple of extra bucks from the tooth fairy and then we're good to go yeah they don't see this as body parts yeah they don't see that when a tooth gets removed 
that you are amputating a body part because yeah. the body is literally demonstrating signs of distress. They don't see things like 90% of systemic diseases and nutritional deficiencies can be seen in the oral cavity first. That I can tell if a patient is pregnant just by looking in their mouth. You the can? Time. Oh, yeah. Really? I've, I've sent patients to get HIV tests done. Most hygienists, most hygienists are right now sitting there nodding and going, yeah. yep, that we've sent patients to get blood work done for autoimmune issues, nutritional deficiencies, something. That we know when something is wrong. You see too much. We, that's the issue. We see too much. And so now inside of this hygiene hour, we're trying to find these magic minutes of how do we expedite some of the, the quick things that we need to do? because really the reason why the patient's here is for their free donut holes. That's right. what they're here for. Yeah. And I'm trying to walk this patient through the fact that I don't think your free donut holes is going to suffice for today. Right. Because inside of this, you have all of these other factors. And if we don't address this, we're talking about cardiovascular disease. We're talking about stroke, right. upper respiratory tract infections, diabetes, certain types of cancers. Right. So no, you're not going to die in my chair today. Right. But I don't want to sit and watch my patient population get sicker and sicker. And right. unfortunately, that has what has started to occur. Yeah. You know, I, I shared earlier in this recording that we see periodontitis on the rise. Yeah. Uh, it, the amount of periodontitis from the 1990s to today has increased about 55%. What's your hypothesis? My hypothesis on this is number one, patients are living longer and living longer with their teeth right. instead of having them extracted and wearing dentures. Right. So we're starting to see some complications there. Inside of that, I think we're also getting a lot clearer about how to diagnose periodontitis. And right. so because of that, that's giving us a lot more information and in how to address our patients. But I think the biggest issue is that uh, with all of the economic recessions, some of the complications that we've had, that the bread and butter of dentistry is the patient will come in and get their free cleaning, their insurance covers. They will get their dental x-rays done, their bite wings once a year and the doctor exam. And so we have relied on trying to manage a lot of this disease inside of what is truly a preventive procedure. Right. I and mean, that's one of those things you have to break as a dentist to go any further because you can speak to this and we teach this all the time. You know it better than us. When the 4,000 codes go up. So most That's dentists right. do the whole 80-20 split mm -hmm. and, you know, we make our money in restorative and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Once you get this department thinking the right way, we're all on the same page. What happens when 4,000 codes go up? What happens to the, to the other side? Like, right. And, and it's interesting because there is data that says that once you increase those 4,000 codes, right. the data says that if a patient identifies that they have periodontal disease and they move forward with treatment, yep. that they have now built a value inside of understanding their oral health and are now more motivated to acquire the next steps or strategies to continue to maintain their oral health. You said that better than anybody. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. No. Well, actually, you know who says it the best is oh. Hippocrates. I'm going to, this is like so nerdy. I'm going to quote Hippocrates because okay. what he says is just absolutely critical. He says, true illness does not occur out of the blue. It doesn't show up. Decay doesn't show up out of the blue. Perio doesn't show up out of the blue. People don't just have a heart attack. Right. It doesn't show up out of the blue. He says, it's now this is Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. Yeah. This is like in the BCs, right? Um, he says that disease is formed from small daily sins against nature. When enough daily sins have, a, have accumulated, illness will occur. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the issue. Let's pretend you have a patient who's been a long time patient of your practice. Like they, they started seeing you when they were, you know, 18 years old, you know, fresh out of high school. My brother's a really great example. I'll pick on my brother at 18 years old. He became a patient of mine because okay. he moved down to Arizona. He went to Arizona state. So he's been a patient of mine. And you know, my, my brother's into his thirties now he's okay. married. He's, you know, and he's still a patient of mine. So we see patients over a long time like that, right? How does that happen that a patient at 18 has a clean health history? Mm. And then by the time the patient's in their 40s, oh, they've got high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And then by the time they're in their 50s, they're pre-diabetic. And then by the time they're, you know what I'm saying? How is this happening? We are literally spectators watching the spectrum of disease happen for our patients. Yeah. They're getting sicker. Yeah. And yet inside of that, if we can stop the propagation of that disease and I think demonstrate to our patients, I think that's what it is, demonstrating to our patients that we are with them on this journey. Yeah. Because- I do see patients that will say, I didn't know that the inflammation in my mouth could be making my blood pressure worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can. And in the United States, we're so used to just taking medication for that yeah. or telling the patient not to consume as much salt. Yeah. When the reality is my work could be influencing. 100%. Right? Now the issue is I don't think dentistry has been armed and leveraged enough to feel confident inside of those conversations. Tell me more. Like, 
just go there. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go there. <laughs> so, you know, we'll read an article or whatever. Um, and we'll use that as like a little jab for the patient. Yeah. Well, you know, um, if we if we treat your periodontal disease, that that could, you know, help your help your heart condition. But it's it's the flywheel. It's right. the good to great, right? It's the concept of all of these things have to accumulate together. So these same practices, when I ask them, do you take blood pressure on your patient? They'll say, oh no, only if doctor's gonna use anesthetic today. Okay. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Right. Meaning if you're actually concerned about that patient's cardiovascular condition, why are you not monitoring it? 100%. 27 million Americans will see a dentist, but they will not see their primary care physician this year. 27 million individuals. Now that's crazy because that means that we are theoretically seen as the preventive specialist for 27 million individuals. Yeah. So now we talk about medical and dental integration and we talk about the fact that if, if we say to the patient, well, you have inflammation in your mouth and I'm concerned about that inflammation, it could be affecting your heart, but we're not demonstrating that we actually care about that. We're not walking through that health history top down and saying, tell me about your high blood pressure. When were you diagnosed with it? Who's monitoring it? When is the last time you had it actively monitored? Have you seen changes in the dosages of your medications? Have you added medications? Right. Are you experiencing the side effects of those medications? Now, what am I doing? I'm showing my patient, we got a spotlight on the fact that I'm concerned about your heart. Yeah, you're here for your teeth cleaning. We'll talk about that later. I'm concerned about your heart. Yeah. And I've, I've front loaded with that. Yeah. Now I'm doing a head and neck examination and I had shared, you know, uh, four to C granules is a really great observation. Four to C granules um, uh, are fatty deposits underneath the oral tissue or xanthoma um, you can see on the face. Now I identify those things and I'm telling the patient, you have these lesions in your mouth that tell me that you have fatty deposits in your oral tissue. When is the last time you had your cholesterol checked? Okay. I haven't even started cleaning their teeth. Yeah. Now think about what's happening inside of the brain of that patient. Yeah. Right now it's, oh, you know, I, I was here to get my free donut holes. Right. And now you're walking me through this gourmet experience of all of these amazing donuts that right. I can experience. And you're, you're pairing them with gorgeous, you know, mochas and cappuccinos. You're walking me through a completely different experience. I don't, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm here to experience this now. Right. Right. It changes now. And, and again, you know, to, to, we were distilling down to a donut experience, but the important piece being, when you ask your patients, is your oral health, is your physical health something that you value? Yeah. That's I, what you're asking. Right? I think, I mean, you're a genius and you already know I've, t oh, I've said that. You. I think if the Dunkin' Donuts CEO is watching this, yeah. he would say we could add 30% in revenues. There you go. I mean, there's, there's so many things you said. Like, first of all, I'm, I'm completely amazed every Dunkin' Donuts has a line. Okay. Yes. Of, of app in there and they have you know, employees that have a lot of apathy. <laughs> so let's just turn That's it nice up a little bit. Yes, notch. You absolutely. know, I mean, that alone would change things. Now let's go back to the, the dental experience because um, we could go down a lot of rabbit yeah, holes here, but, but you're saying so many powerful things. This is when you transform what you do. And in a world where there's so much research on there, I, I love the global stuff. I'm a big thinker mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a world where we're starving for significant relationships. Like we're yes. starving for them. A healthcare yes. provider, mm -hmm. uh, a professional. This is your opportunity, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? To become just more than a dental office, you know? Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that significance has very much changed as now people have access to be able to Google or research things. Right. Um, people are taking their healthcare into their own hands. They're recognizing that just because I was provided this Cigna or Delta Dental, you know, insurance plan doesn't mean that I have to be tethered to exactly what this insurance plan says. Right. So you're starting to see a lot of exploration. Um, the millennial spending shift that we're starting to see where millennials, I, I, I am a millennial, I'll be at the oldest of the millennials, but mm. I am a millennial that we're starting to see a shift in that renewed sense of health, wellness, and vitality. Sure. The global health crisis kicked open that door for people to say, you know, I, I recognize that I need to be protecting myself. I need to be protecting my family that, you know, a lot of us didn't necessarily fully understand that you could have a disease uh, asymptomatically 
you could have a disease and that disease could be something that can impact you from a long-term standpoint. Yeah. So yes, we're starting to see a lot of that research come out. And yet inside of dentistry and medicine, you know, people say it all the time. Like I didn't go to hygiene school for your in dental insurance company to tell me what it is that I need to do. Yeah. Because if that's all I had to do, if all I had to do was show up and have an insurance company say, thank you for taking the x-rays. Here's what you need to do and just do it. Yeah. Then I, we, I, I could have expedited. I, it would have taken me three months to get through hygiene school. Yeah. There's a reason why we understand the complexities of the work that we do. And part of that significance of our work and the significance of the relationship that we have with our patient, I do believe boils back to, I feel insignificant as a dental hygienist when I am told that the power of my work is in the Dentrix appointment book that says four bite wings, profi exam. Four by wings, profi exam. Four by wings, profi exam. Because respectfully, that is not how disease works. And that is not how my clinical decision making works. You and I could create like this. I there's there, we, we could create a little fun show. I a mean, fun you're, show? You're, well, I've you, been having fun. I know, no, 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 like, 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 a, like a little satire on oh, what really yeah. happens in dental office. Now, because it's true. It's so it's true. So true. It's, it's so true. Now. I know you had an agenda for this and I totally stole I totally it from agenda. you. No, that'll be for the next show. That'll next be for the show, next, show. next show. I have a couple thoughts. Number one is, you know, we're big fans of yours. I think you're going to, this is going to be so much fun. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put a question into three different parts. Number one, I am very biased that there's not a ton of great hygiene education. There just isn't. There's some, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but nothing you go, that was fantastic mm -hmm. today and tomorrow they will all say that was fantastic. Oh, Number two, so. you're a rock star. You're everywhere. Like mm -hmm. every time you leave a room, I was speaking in Kansas city. I had like 12 people in a room. No, she had like, seven. she had 1700. I had to <laughs> go over there and shush her like four times. I'm like, I'm trying to talk to my 12 Actually, you people did. Can here. Can I tell you about Kansas city really fast? <laughs> what? So I had lost my voice. I had laryngitis. Yeah. I had been traveling and speaking and all of that. So I had like no voice. I'm like squeaking, trying to get it out. And I presented for the whole day, just like you did. Yeah. And so to like kind of help our audience understand, um, we're in these conference halls and there's just that like thin, like partition, like the thing that they like that folds up. Yeah. That was the only thing separating your room from my room. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hello and welcome to, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. And you're next door and you're like, and like, I mean, just this like whole thing. So the whole time people keep like looking over at the wall and I'm like, that's my buddy, Kirk. Don't worry about it. I'll give him some grief later. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You're very kind. You, you heard my voice, but what you didn't hear I was did. a bunch of people going. No, yeah. hardly. Uh, so hardly. Here's my real question. Where are you going next? So you brought all your wines. Yes, like what's, yes. what's the next chapter? for Katrina Sanders? Oh my gosh. I, that's, that's a fabulous question. Um, the next chapter for me is to change or transform how I'm doing what I'm doing. Tell me more. I'm starting to get a lot of people wanting to see how this actually gets done. Okay. I'm getting people saying, can I shadow you? Can I watch they want to see how the sausage is made. You know what I mean? They right. really want to see what that clinical care looks like. How do you sit down and confidently communicate with a patient? As much as I get doctors that say, hey, how do they get, they do this all the time. How can I get my hygienist to talk to my patients the way you talk to your patients? Well, respectfully, I can talk to my patients with confidence because I've got a doctor that'll back me up. So my question to that doctor is, how can you learn from my doctors right. how they support me? Because Confidence is a critical aspect to building trust. And I can confidently sit and talk to a patient. Yes, albeit I know the research, I've done the research. I can I I feel pretty confident that, you know, if my back is against the wall and a patient asks me a question about something, I probably know the answer or I'll be the first to say, I don't have that answer, but I, I'm going to get you that answer and I'll shoot you an email with that information. Right. But my doctors um, support me inside of that. And I think as much as people seek continuing education or reading articles or listening to podcasts, they want to be able to see it done and integrated. And so I'm right now working in masterminding uh, an academy. Wow. An academy for dental hygienists to acquire advanced training, advanced hand skills. Yeah. Because, gosh, the last time that I was taught, that most hygienists were taught how to hold an instrument and activate it the correct way was hygiene school. Yeah. And we have to be able to, pun intended, sharpen those skills mm -hmm. um, in order to support that our patients. Good. And yeah, thank you. I'm just coming up with all these puns <laughs> today. Um, we have to be able to build that out. And, and I want to be able to create a safe space for hygienists to yeah. be able to feel uh, not only that they have the support in developing their clinical skills, but feeling that sense of professional responsibility. Yeah. Um, I, um, I always work to create not only educational opportunities, but 
to be able to build that sense of confidence, that sense of pride, that sense of, I do amazing work. Yeah. I am incredible because every hour on the hour, some hygienists, it's every 45 minutes, every 30 minutes that you see a patient, that is a life in your chair. Yep. And you have the opportunity to make that life better with your education and your skills. Yeah. 100%. How amazing. What a beautiful thing for we to, for us to be able to celebrate or for we to, we uh for our profession to be able to experience. And yet we get so taken aback by all of the complications that get in the way of us being successful. Dental insurance, right. um, you know, patients not believing the level of care that we need, um, not having correct equipment, you know, all of these things. So I want to be able to create an academy that helps elevate dental hygiene to the space where we need to be because we are the mid-level practitioners in the clinical practice and we absolutely should have the skills, the the talents, the resources, the confidence right. to be able to deliver those skills for our patients. I love it. I love it. So this is called Voluntolding. You don't even know okay. about it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. when that's ready to go, guess where you're going to announce it? <laughs> oh my word. She doesn't have a choice. Here, well, I, no, seriously. I, would, I wouldn't I, want to go anywhere else well, I appreciate here that. in my, I appreciate my that. roots. There's no place like home. Well, you are our GM. I mean, our core values are aligned. It's fun. It's fun when you put those together. So um, mm. I can't wait for one. It's not going to be just clinical education, no. though. It's, no. you're, it's the behavioral. It's the verbal skills. I mean, all of that stuff matters. Yes. And the instrumentation is changing faster than ever. It is. So, and um, the hardest part for dental hygienists is the leadership piece. For sure. I think we really struggle with that. Um, you, you give me an instrument, I'll figure out how to make it work. But we have to be leaders in yeah. our practice. We have to lead in front of our assistants. We have to lead ourselves. We have to lead in front of our colleagues. We have to lead with the doctor. We have to lead with our front office team members who, who don't oftentimes understand the clinical reasons why. And so leadership becomes a critical aspect to that. But we have to be able to build out the confidence, the right. consistency, the clarity. We have to be able to build out a lot of those pieces so that when the clinicians get back into clinical practice, that they can do so as a transformed clinician. Yeah, I swear we were separated at birth because one of the things that we say in this room all the time, it's every practices don't get better. Leaders That's right. get better. You know what I mean? That's so right. like, I think if we can get our heads straight, I mean, I'm so excited. Um, give, us, give us your last final thoughts as we close this episode. You know, yeah, if I'm listening- yeah. I, you know, I always have final thoughts yeah. everywhere I go. You know, I, it, I'm always reminded every time I'm back home, I'm reminded of my roots and I'm reminded of where I came from and I'm reminded of mom and dad. And I think about, um, for those who know my story, um, we lost my mom in 2018, suddenly, tragically, unexpectedly. And then two years, just over two years later, we lost dad suddenly, tragically, unexpectedly both of them needlessly with diseases, um, ac acute infections that should have been identified by healthcare practitioners who had been routinely seeing my parents, but it was skipped because they did the bare minimum. Right. They did the things that they needed to do in order to cover their butts and not get sued, but it wasn't enough. And when we think about the importance of the work that we do, we have to start looking at not just what is going to be enough, but what is the correct way to care for patients sitting in our chairs, knowing that those individuals are somebody's mom, somebody's dad, somebody's brother, somebody's sister, that dentistry has a responsibility to these individuals. Yeah. And that goes well beyond the bare minimum, whatever it is we need to do to not get sued, whatever it is we need to do to submit enough to insurance companies so that we can cover our production. Yeah. This is about human beings. And so it's, it's an honor to be here in Milwaukee sharing that message from my roots. There you go. There you have it. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah. If you guys, if you're watching this, um, We'll, we'll put this in later, but if you're listening, whether it be on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, you're going to flip up, flip up to the notes. You'll see if you're not taking notes, don't worry. We took notes for you. They will all be there. You're also going to see links to all of what Katrina does, um, her social media, all of those things. Just if, if you do anything, just click follow. You're going to learn a lot. You're thank quite you. the social media genius. Like, oh my um, gosh, thank you for saying that. Yeah, you are. That's I don't know so how nice. you do what you do, but it's pretty cool. So, 
Uh, but, I don't uh, either. Yeah. Well, stick Just around. To- say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening or watching the Best Practices Show, wherever you're consuming podcasts. We don't even know anymore. So, um, But keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys want to see. You're going to see we're going to have Katrina back again and again and again. We're going to have you back for the courses here in yes. Milwaukee. This one sold out pretty quick. When's it the did. next yeah. one? I don't um, even know. Next one's in October. Yeah. So if you're even interested in going, you better register now. Yeah. Because yeah, it will we'll, sell out. It will. Yeah. I mean, anytime you bring wine and dentistry, together it's going to sell out i'm so, so excited for this one. pumped it's going to be too. awesome so oh, it's cool, going to be amazing cool 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 so until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time keep watching or keep listening to the best practice show you guys enjoy your day